Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. We're super happy today to have Gavin Mendel Gleason from Terminus DB to come give a talk with us about, you know, about the system that they're building. Uh, Gavin, got, is, Gavin is the co founder and CTO of Terminus DB. He got his PhD in computer science uh, from Dublin, uh, Dublin City University, right? Yep. Okay. And then he did an undergraduate degree in uh, math you know, from the University of New Mexico. He was briefly a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon in physics, not computer science, realized that was a dead end job, and <laughs> then moved to, uh, moved to Europe to do his PhD in computer science. Um, so uh, we also have a sponsor today for this talk. We are actually sponsored by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real. Uh, the foundation will be sponsoring all the quarantine talks we have this semester, so we appreciate them uh, for help, helping us out. And this is this is a real sponsorship. This is, I'm not making this up. Uh, and uh, so the way we'll do today is that, uh, like always, if you have any questions for Gavin as he's talking, please unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're coming from, and then ask your question. Right? And then feel free to interrupt as uh, anytime you want. We want this thing to be interactive. Okay? All right, Gavin, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you for being here. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. So uh, I'm Gavin, as uh, introduced from Terminus DB, and I want to talk a little bit about building a native revision control graph database uh, from the ground up. So uh, first, I'll give a little bit of an outline of um, the motivation, and then I'll talk about the architecture. OK, so basically, the first question, I guess, is we're, we're a graph database. Uh, so why graph in the first place? Uh, now, there's a lot of people out there that are um, really into uh, relational databases, and uh, I, I definitely would have fallen into that class. So um, I, I know a lot of the positives, but uh, there's also there's some advantages to graph databases uh, as well. So when I was at Trinity College uh, Dublin, uh, we got a, uh, a three million uh, investment from Europe to do a, a large scale research project on uh, which was partly the SESHAT Global Historical Data Bank. And that was a very ambitious project to store information about every polity in human history and various different data points about them in order to do uh, analytics on the back of it and to, do, to try to find information about historical trends. So uh, there's been a lot of publications came out of that. A lot of interesting research came out of that, um, including information about resilience of societies, things that I think are really relevant to our current uh, climate uh, because uh, climate change and other things can cause uh, societies to collapse. And although people don't remember it now, it's, it wasn't that long ago when we had very big disruptions. So um, the SESHAC Global Historical Data Bank was really a sprawling collection of data sets. There's loads of different data sets. It had very complicated hand curated ontology. So a, a design of the various types of things they wanted to store, what they were related to. And it was all kept in a giant wiki, essentially uh, with people hand curated, all these um, postdoctoral students and graduate students and undergraduates uh, curating this massive interrelated information. And it made it very difficult to get information out of uh, in order to do the analysis. Uh, but it was also, it had a lot of junk in it because there wasn't a strong schematic control over it. But turning it into an RDBMS was really, uh, really hard to imagine because you would be talking about either having enormous numbers of tables or sort of simulating a graph inside of an RDBMS in order to store all the various different kinds of things that were in there. So instead of uh, simulating a graph, we decided to just go with the graph in the first place. So the, uh, the other thing that was necessary on the SESHAT Global Historical da Data Bank was that they, they had to be able to change the schema quite a lot. So you really needed tools to be able to both visualize and to alter the schema as things moved forward and to lift the data along with it as it changed. So mostly adding new things, but also uh, sometimes modifying information that was in there. Uh, so that, that's part of it. And 
coupled with that is was a need to to have revision control essentially because they they needed some way of being able to see who it was who added uh information because it was being added by graduate students etc and then sort of being able to verify it and then merge it into something later so you can already start to see some of the revision control aspects at the very beginning of the project so the second one that we looked at was uh, that, that we started on was this uh, partnership with Walters Kluwer, which was looking at um, commercial intelligence. And again, we already had a graph, so we were sort of working in the graph space, but they wanted to scale it up to a lot more uh, types of relationships between things. And in this case, you have another example where a graph is a very natural fit. So the, the kinds of questions they wanted to ask were like, okay, are these two people connected by some kind of uh, relationship or some multi-hop relationship? Um, and like we've, we were asked to find things like, is there anybody who was at some time both a director and uh, also um, adjudicating some case about the company or something along those lines? So uh, conflicts of interest, et cetera. And the other re relatively strange thing that they asked us that we searched for and found uh, is if there were any shareholding cycles. So if a company o owns shares and company, company A owns shares and company B owns shares and company C owns shares again in company A. And one might think that that is, uh, you know, uh, impossible, but in fact, there's lots of them in Poland as it turns out. <laughs> and a lot of them look quite shady. Uh, when we mentioned it to our accountant, they, they said, oh yeah, the washing machine, I know that one. So you can imagine what you're washing. Uh, <laughs> so, this, this was only in Poland? Or this is like the data so this, you Yes, this is, this is basically the entire, every director, person, uh, shareholding of every public company, everything that was registered through the court system, uh, every, like there was a number, number of relationships, their addresses, et cetera for all of Poland since 1992. So uh, that ends, ends up being a lot of relationships at the end of the day. Um, yeah, and, and the last one is that, uh, well, it's it can be useful to use a graph when you don't know what you're indexing. So if you have like a lot of data uh, in a sort of document format and you just wanna be able to throw it into something and then find start sort of anywhere you like inside of the object and look for stuff, then then a graph makes a fair bit of sense. So um, those are the kinds of projects that we've worked on, things that use those, th you know, things where graph is the natural answer. So the other question, I guess, is why a distributed revision control system? And here, I think this, uh, you know, we, we started with some ideas of revision control in the initial project. And as we move forward, we found that that's actually more important in a lot of areas in uh, industry, and it's an underserved area. So one of the problems that we have um, right now is that there's a lot of curated data. The data is not necessarily huge. It can be, uh, you know, maybe in the tens of millions or, or around that size of, of edges in a graph. And But there's this need to test it out, test some code on that, and then only after you know that it works with the code, deploy it to production. And so these sorts of pipelining operations are relatively difficult with the, with databases as they currently stand. And it's like with Git, with CICD type uh, approaches, it's very easy to do those types of operations on code. And so we, that it, uh, there's a, there's a sort of hole in the market for those types of, uh, CI, CD with data rather than code. And Git is really an amazing, I mean, it's just caused a revolution in the way the code was written. Uh, it's really been, it's so much better than when I first started programming. Okay, so now to go back to the architecture of like how we have tried to solve these coupled problems at the same time. So we have a relatively uh, unusual architecture uh, and but it has some advantages, and I, I think maybe you guys can you guys can inquire about it. So we represent um, our data as graphs, as I said, and those are stored as triples. So we have a, a some kind of triples notionally that uh, describe the graph. So you you decompose the graph into these triples s zero to a, by lift nozzle to s one. So it's a labeled graph because each of the edges has a label, and uh, all of the nodes have labels as well. Okay. So, and we represent these graphs with succinct data structures. And so a succinct data structure is a data structure with some 
kind of access uh, um, uh, complexity that that is designed to approach the information theoretic minimum size of the object. So, for instance, the labels that we store we store as a front coded a plain front coding dictionary, and then we use uh, log arrays in order to store the information uh, from the graph, and that creates a very compact data structure. So in order to, to, to uh, update the data structure, because it's so compact and because it's not really designed as a, uh, a pointer tree, uh, it's just a, a, a plane, uh, what we do is we actually store the deltas as separate objects. So we have like all of the subtracted triples and all the added triples, and then you have a chain. And because you have the, these chains, you end up with something that looks a lot like a uh, revision, like deltas in Git. So the head of your database is, is just uh, where you start searching. When you come in with a search, you'll, you'll look for 987, for instance. If you search for 987, it'll immediately return. If instead you search for XYZ, you'll go down to the furthest plane down. You'll find the XYZ is there and it'll be subtracted as x, y, z here on the way back up. Now, actually, if you're going on the way down and you know that x, y, and z are all bound to definite, uh, definite values, you can stop on the second plane without going all the way to the bottom. But if you don't know, if you're actually searching uh, a generic uh, unbound variables, then you have to go through the whole thing. So uh, in order to point to the head, uh, we have something called a label. And the label is a file that points at a layer. It tells you what the current head is. Uh, so that means that you can, you, can do a, uh, you can do updates in a safe manner. So you can do a speculative update, try and see if it's valid. And then only after you commit, you can move the head in a single atomic operation. And these things can happen uh, Concurrently, you can have uh, as many searches as you like simultaneously. There's no locking that's necessary there. You only have to worry about when you move the head itself. Okay, so um, real, real quickly, so, so these labels yeah. are—it's just the so, so you have like a, the the root of the there's a master record that points to whatever whatever the root of the or that head is. That's and it. So you plop down a file, you put all your changes in, in there, and then you then you do a compare and swap on whatever the head to that's right. your new file. That's okay. it. That's it. Exactly. exactly. So, um, okay. So, uh, but that's but what we wanted for, for instance, for the Seshet project, that wasn't a sufficient um, uh, complexity. We actually needed more things at once. So we store our schemas as triples as well. So we, our, our schema is a graph. And that graph describes what's in the instance graph. And the instance graph is constrained to always uh, conform to the information in the schema. We also want to be able to keep information, metadata, about the commit history, the timestamps, authors, messages, and that kind of thing. And then you also you want to be able to store information about branches and tags and versions uh, and such like that. So we have an additional. Um, uh, so we, we developed another approach, which is that we allow graphs to store information about what layers they're talking about. Uh, and then you move the head of that graph um, after you've already put into place all of the subordinate graphs um, in one big operation with the head again. So that you can, you can do a, com you move the head of the individual graphs that are associated, the schema graph, the instance graph, then you move the commit graph head, then you, you move the, the pointer from the label. OK, and I'll have a picture for that if, for you, Andy, so to make it a little bit easier to see. OK, so this is the simplest. So what we have is we have a, a label object. It's called my DB label, and it points at a layer. And inside of that layer, there's a, a, a a label object as well, it's a, which points to another layer. And when you, when you update, you, so you add a new layer that describes this movement of the, uh, that you're, you've added another layer, and then you finally move the d database label at the end of the day. OK, so 
that's that uh, object which keeps track of which uh, commits have been made is called the commit graph, and it is actually a graph itself. So, uh, why a commit graph? Well, we have to keep information about these commits. We want the the history, all of those things. We want to keep the met metadata about it. So, uh, the commit graph has the commit objects. It has the named graph objects which are being pointed to. It tells you whether they're instance, schema, or inference graphs. So I haven't talked about inference graphs, but inference graphs allow you to also do automatic inference on, on some of, uh, by using a, a rule-based system. Um, and then you have layer references which are pointed to uh, by the named graph. And those layer references actually point to the, the on-disk um, uh, layers. OK, and then we also have uh, some uh, technical facts of RDF. So RDF is uh, a way of describing all of the labels of your system. Uh, instead of using uh, a sort of a, a uh, nominal pointer or something like that, you use a, an IRI, which is supposed to give you a, a way to have a sort of semi-readable but unique uh, object identifier. OK. so. The commit graph, uh, this is sort of a pictorial representation of what it looks like. F, E, D, C, B, and A are all uh, commit objects. They point to their parent. And each of them has um, an instance and a schema pointer. Uh, and that graph itself then has a pointer to its layer object that's associated with it. And this entire commit graph itself also is the head of some uh, chain of layers. OK. So the commit graph is also a validated graph. It also has a schema. Uh, and all of the, the schema works in the same way that it does for the lower level, or for the, the databases themselves. Uh, it's actually shouldn't be necessary, because um, hopefully everything that we put in the commit graph is uh, directed by our system. And our system never makes any mistakes. But actually, sometimes we've made mistakes. So at the moment, we leave. Uh, schema checking on because uh, it, it doesn't seem to impact performance too much, and it's uh, and it has found bugs in the way that we were entering information. So is you can it, keep constraints. The schema in your world is just that you have a triplet. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So the 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 triples. So we have like there's a graph that represents the constraints that are in that have to be uh, satisfied by our instance graph. Okay, but again, but then. Those the, the, those constraints are just like it has to be a triplet, right? There's nothing like what else is, is there, or is there is it like the schema is not including the type of like of, of like what the label oh, yeah. has so, to be? Yeah, no, it, it can say things like uh, you can only have uh, so many of these property, or you you know you okay. have to you, you can't have not have this property, or you know um, these are the properties you have, or uh, things it's, like it's, you it's, point it's, from it's this thing level. to that thing. Yeah. So gotcha. it's a high level description of uh, what kinds of things can be pointed to to give okay. constraints on the, on the shape okay. of the graph. All right, cool, awesome, thank you. That's right. OK, and the commit graph itself is queryable in our query language. So our query language is a, it's a sort of a data log-like language uh, that allows you to query the graph. And the commit graph, all of the internal queries inside of the database also use our query language in order to do operations on the commit graph. So it's quite meta-circular. Uh, and then we have one layer above that is a metadata graph, which points to the commit graph. And the reason for this is if you have multiple, um, because like in Git, you, you often want to have remote objects. You want to keep two things in sync. You want to be able to pull and push to them. Then you have to have some way of reconciling the history. So we have another graph that points to all of the repositories that are currently being talked about uh, by the database. It, it also it will have the remote URL, so it knows how to send and receive from the remote object. Um, and it, it will also have other information in the future to do pipelining operations more effectively. OK. So with the metadata graph, then we're, we're able to do things like clone, push, pull, um, fetch, uh, et cetera. And those operations are implemented by actually transmitting the layers um, from the commit graph uh, across the wire. So uh, 
finally, we have one other graph, uh, a system graph, but it's not in the hierarchy, actually. So what does it contain? It, it contains information about uh, authentication and authorization and capabilities. So it, it de decides whether or not you're allowed to do some kind of operation on some certain set of objects uh, and controls the query to make sure that uh, you don't do anything dodgy. And it also keeps track of all the database names and, and uh, who the organizations and authors are that are associated with it. So, but the system graph is not, a, it's not at the top, it's not actually above the metadata graph. And the reason for that is we, we don't want to have to move, like uh, you want to be able to move all of the databases independently without actually um, having contention for the system graph. So that's, that's the reason that it's separate. So the overall architectural picture is here. You see the system graph kind of, it points, it has information about the name of a, a layer. And then that name then gives you the head of a metadata graph. And then that gives you, you have like local and remote. The local would point to the head of uh, the commit graph. And then the, the commit graph, you'd look for maybe main branch there. And then you can find the head layer for the main instance graph and the main schema graph uh, from there. And that gives you sort of the, the high level uh, overview of what the system looks like in terms of its architecture. So maybe I'll just give you a, a, a peek at, at the, uh, the system. So real quickly, so like the, yeah. the, I mean, this is the physical storage layer. So like the, the user that writes the query over the REST API, they don't know about any of this, right? Other than no. you just have revisions. This is internally how you're maintaining this. That's right. Gotcha. That's right. So the only thing they'll see is I have a database it has some branches and yeah. then you know they'll they'll see that there's revisions um for that branch and then you know you can go in and you can write queries and the queries will look at the instance data or you can ask specifically to query the schema information but th mostly the schema information is either you want to add something to the schema take something away um or uh or you you want it to constrain the information that you're adding or taking away from the instance graph. Okay, and so and then the way you would envision someone using this is like it's not like you're doing fine grained transactions, or updating a single record. This is like here's a is a batch of updates, apply them, and then that sort of gets tracked as a, as a separate commit because you have to sort of update a lot of things to do to update one record. That's right. So yeah, so you can imagine, you know, you might add a whole bunch of things at once. Although, you know, it's quite easy. I mean, it's not such a big deal to add just one object at a time. So if you had, for instance, in the Seshat Global Historical Data Bank, it's a very complicated schema. But the and you know, you you say, okay, well, all polities in human history. There's not actually that many polities in human history. And if you're only tracking, you know their population, the area, with their religion, you know, that, that kind of stuff. It's actually not that much information in total. So uh, especially, you know, a lot of times the information is most relevant at 100-year intervals or something like this, then, or 30-year intervals is probably better because you want to get closer to generational cycles. But uh, that's, that's the kind of, if that's the kind of granularity, then it's quite easy to uh, envisage that all of these things are being updated. So. Um, the the in order to increase performance though like so if if you have a large number of revisions the queries are going to get slow so we have uh, something called the delta rollup so you can ask for a certain layer to have an equivalence layer and then that then you can search in that equivalence layer if you just want to do a query on the database at that point that's, and that's, that, that, that's like a compaction or a squashing that's right. It's a compaction. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. So this is this is uh, when you download Terminus DB, you go to your local host, and uh, you can actually see uh, a sort of a front end to the database. So you can create a new database. Let's say we just go here, and uh, once uh, let me try to get my notes really quickly. <laughs> the, the mascot's a, a cow. It's a cow duck. Okay, that's, that's, I wasn't sure what that was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, we we actually uh, th there's a story behind it, but it has to do with the uh, graphs. So um, do you see that? Uh, I see. Like yes. 
Okay, so, okay. I see bank, yep. Okay. Sorry. Okay, bank. Okay, so here there's a, we can ask for it to be shared. Uh, so I'm currently logged into Terminus Hub. And Terminus Hub gives you a way, it's like GitHub, so you can push and pull from there. Uh, so you're probably familiar with that from Dolt, because they also uh, have gone that direction. Um, and then and you can add a banking example, add a description of the database, uh, create new database, and uh, then it goes ahead, creates it on Hub, uh, and then clones it to my local machine. Uh, so then I can do push and pull operations to it. So I can go to, uh, um, for instance, I can go to query, uh, and this gives me a query viewer, um, and I can say, okay, I, I want to add a schema to this. So I have a, a schema written, and what this says is I want to add a bank account type of document uh, with the property owner, and I want the uh, data type value to be a string. And then balance, um, I want the, uh, the balance to be a non-negative integer, and I want them to be constrained to be of cardinality one. Uh, I run the query, and then it does those inserts. And if I go to schema, uh, and I look at uh, the owl, it shows, it actually writes this, um, this RDF owl information for me. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you are with sort of semantic web stuff, but this is a, a language that was used for describing ontologies. Uh, but it, it's nice because it can give you information about like cardinalities, et cetera. And uh, you'll notice that I, I made a mistake. So I can either edit through the query system or I can, I can go in here and just edit the file. I called uh, the label of balance or the label of uh, balance was owner there, which is wrong. So I can save the changes and it actually updates the schema. Here you can see which gra graphs I have. I have two, they're both called main, and one of them's an instance graph and one of them's a schema graph. So I can then, once I have a schema, um, I can go in uh, back to the query browser. I can uh, ask to add some triples to it. I run the query and it adds the information to the database. Uh, then if I, I look here at documents, you can see I've added this uh, document ID mic uh, and it's a bank account object. So uh, th that gives you an idea of like, you know, how the, how the sort of um, approach of adding information goes. Um, however, I might like, uh, I might want to um, edit some of the information. So I might say, okay, um, I want to uh, search for uh, Mike, find out what balance, um, Mike has in his bank account, and then I want to get rid of that balance, uh, and I want to add a new balance. So I try and I run the query, and it says actually that's a violation because this is a non-negative integer, and it's now negative seven, so you can't do that. Uh, and it throws back; it actually sends you back a, a JSON LD witness object. So it's um, uh, it's you can see the information here, but if you're programmatically looking at it, it's quite useful because you get a information about what the precise error in the schema was. Um, and there's also a schema that describes how that, uh, what that error is. Okay, so, um, so let's see. So if I go back here uh, to the bank, uh, I can go to um, manage and I can say, create a new branch, uh, and I can call this new branch, branch office. Uh, create the new branch starting from the time now. Um, so you can edit that by clicking this uh, time object. The time object will look at the past history of commits, so you can move to past commits um, and branch from them. So I can create this new branch offi office, and now when I go to the branch office, um, right now, I have the same documents in them. However, if I do, uh, if I add some information to it, um, uh, say I add another guy, Jim, uh, run the query, then 
I go to documents, you'll see I have Mike and Jim in there. But in main, I only have Mike in the in the branch uh, branching system. OK, so then if I go to uh, the query system here, and then I say, um, say I add one more person. So I can, I can say I would like to add Jane. I run the query, um, and I get a new update. And then when I go back to, uh, um, so, sorry, that I was in main when I did that. So what I will do is I will uh, do a rebase operation, starting from main and merging into the branch office. Oops. Uh, for some reason, I can't do that. Must have. It's OK. Yeah, sorry. So mostly use the uh, programmatic interface. But that, that was actually my question. But like, 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 people have Git, right? Like, uh, I, I, whoever just messaged you told you how to fix it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I can't see it. Anyhow, <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually, I mean, what I would really do if, if I was using, using, when I'm using it in anger, um, sorry, my uh, Zoom thing is not allowing me to release. You're trying to like unshare and then add it back? Yeah, I was trying to unshare this. Uh, um, but my a, at the top, it should be like stop share. Yeah, except it's. It, I tried to grab it, and it moved off of my screen. So I actually can't unshare it now. Uh, it, can you see that? I see that, yes. All right, that's better. OK. Um, so what I would actually do is uh, uh, is write something in Python in order to do it. So, for instance, you know, you would actually implement all of these. You do these operations, creating the graphs and doing the execution of these queries from from Python directly. So it's a lot more convenient than using the the front end interface. But it's nice to be able to use the front end for browsing, and it's actually not bad for query if you're not uh, if you don't have to. Uh, um, if you're not trying to do like programmatic updates or anything complicated. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I mean the, the Dolt guys, not, again, not, not to do comparison, but they had basically you know a clone of like the of the Git command line tool. Like, That's you, right. Like, is, is there something similar like that for you guys, or everything is either Python or the web interface? Uh, right now, it's the it, Python and the web interface, but we are definitely we're going to make a command line tool in the near future. Got it. Yeah, um, it's not too complicated to. Sure, yeah, to yeah, do yeah. on top of it, yeah. So, and that, that sort of concludes it. So, uh, okay. do you have any uh, questions or? Awesome. Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll applaud for, uh, for people because, again, we're, we're virtual. Um, so, <laughs> we, uh, again, if, if anybody has any questions, uh, mute yourself uh, and then, again, say who you are and where you're coming from. Um, and we, we, we can do this for, for a bit. So does anybody have any questions? Open it to the floor. Uh, yeah, this is Joel Bender, Cornell University. Um, I have a relatively large batch of RDF content to upload. Um, mm -hmm. Is there an easy way to do that? Yeah, so I mean, it's it, it, you can just upload it through, we, I like here's a fast TTL load thing. So you oh, just yeah, create okay. a database in Python and then you know open the, t, the turtle file and then do update the triples or insert the triples and it'll throw it in there. Okay, and uh, the next question is, um, do you have a connector between RDF Lib and, uh, uh, and Terminus? Uh, we don't have a connector right now, no. Okay. Yep. Okay, awesome, thank you. Next person? So, okay. 
I see, uh, okay, I, you know, obviously you come from the ontology world and therefore maybe the, 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 the owl stuff and, and for you is, is sort of second nature, but I, I like, are you, sorry, I say this, like, by not supporting SQL and not, I mean, or, or even the other, uh, you know, Gremlin or the, or the Cypher or the other graph languages that are out there, like, are, it, it, how does this, it would be sort of, would the kind of person using Terminus be very self-selecting? Like, it wouldn't be your average programmer, right? This seems like someone that has a very specific problem that like, oh, I have some RDF data that they, they want to store. Whereas like the Neo4Js of the world are trying to be sort of like the, the graph database for everybody. And, and so my, my question is like, how much of what you're describing, like you could have a more like sort of, I'm not saying user friendly, but something that like may, may people are more familiar with than the ontology APIs or query languages. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you wanted to just store like uh, arbitrary graph in Terminus, you can just not have a schema. And if you don't have a schema, it won't check anything. And then you're very much like the other sort of graphs that are out there. Okay. Um, the problem with that is that it's really like with, with the relational database management system, you get like tables and tables are really nice in that they give you sort of constraints on the kinds of information that get entered. Now it doesn't perfectly stop you from doing terrible things, but it does help to maintain some level of consistency with graphs. It's really easy to end up with just complete spaghetti uh, because you can attach anything to anything else and uh, then point to anything to anything else. So if you don't have some kind of constraints on what's pointing to what and what it's supposed to be pointing to by, then you get some negative impacts. Now, the second so thing, my, yeah. my question, my question would be for that one is like, how often do people show up with you, like show up and like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in using Terminus DB. I have, I have a graph database, and then they have a schema already. Like, like nobody, it, nobody. Okay, right. So it's a question of like, okay, so how do you how do you make a schema? We have to kind of teach people to do it. But like, if you saw the schema that I entered there, I, I entered it in a query format. It's not that hard to describe which properties you have an object. It has these properties. It points to these objects. It's not too hard to write it down. I think it, it, it's not hard, too hard to get people to start thinking in, in that way. And I think like if we're going to start using graphs seriously, they're going to have to start thinking in that way because otherwise, you know, uh, it becomes pretty unmanageable quickly. But the other advantage of it is that if you're careful about describing your schemata, then you can, you can pull objects out very easily as documents. And that can be really helpful when you're trying to, you know, do use it in a programmatic way. C because sometimes if you have a graph and you try to, like, if you get back a, a table in SQL, it's kind of straightforward what you've gotten out. But a lot of times you want like a fragment of the graph and figuring out how to get that fragment and then get it into a sort of key value pair thing is uh, just extra work. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice if you can get it out. Like people are quite uh, comfortable with document databases, I think, and and so it's nice to be able to have a document database that also you can search as a graph. Got it. Okay. And, and I interrupted you. There, there was something else you were going to bring up as well. I, I, I don't know if you covered that. What's that? The like you, you said two things, and before you got to number two, I I, I interrupted you and asked, asked my other question. Oh. <laughs> okay. I I can't remember what number two was. Okay, <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Um, and then like the, the, the WOQL, like, uh, that is like, is that like, how does this, like, is that query language you're specifying the exact steps of whatever algorithm you want to do, or is it, is it still kind of high level? Like, so you can do like nearest neighbor search or, uh, you know, do, do a path traversal and yeah, therefore well, we we have high level we, we have high level things like path traversal and okay. we'll be adding more things along those lines as we go forward um but yeah it's a it's a high it's both high level and low level at the moment uh query optimization is almost non-existent in the system uh, uh no, but that's my we, question, yes. we intend we intend to add it as we as we go forward so okay. uh, that's so really, it, it's uh, you're kind of giving the layout plan of how it does the search, it, unless you use one of the higher level predicates like uh, like path path queries. Okay, and and then the WOQL is specific to Terminus DB, like like like, like that's your language that you've invented. 
That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we, we can, you know, it's a, it would be possible to expose sort of other query languages on top that are, especially the ones that are sort of RDF designed. Um, but I think RDF is not super popular at the moment uh, no. anyhow. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure it matters that much. I think the main reason that somebody's going to come into this is they want uh, a document store with revision control or they want to be able to have some kind of uh, view into like doing pipelining and that sort of thing and so that the query language is is really not going to be the the main focus of the reason that they start using uh, terminus db but we think like i think personally uh the data logish type query languages are just a lot better than the approaches that they're trying to use in a lot of the the graph community. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like Sparkle is like kind of trying to fit data log into an SQL syntax, and then you end up with something that doesn't compose very well mm -hmm. and is really awkward. Uh, and then, you know, the other ones where you have all these sorts of iteration type approaches, like I, I don't know if you've looked at Tiger DB or any any of those Tiger, but, Tiger Graph Tiger Graph yeah and it's I find that their their interfaces just are not don't have the beauty or simplicity of uh, data log so I think whatever wins in the end is going to be some kind of data logish looking thing just because it's more convenient to express um, recursive algorithms and stuff like that in it. I mean, this is more of a comment about the, the graph data market in general, but like the, the danger of everyone sort of coming up there in languages is that you you may repeat this the issues that the, the object-oriented databases had in the late 80s, where everyone had their own like, query language and no one could ever standardize and did no one thing that unified everyone. And therefore the, uni the ecosystem that could be built around, you know, a, a single language that you're thinking benefit from, you know, is, it just doesn't, doesn't get cultivated, right? Like, if I have SQL, then in theory, I can support Tableau, MicroStrategy, whatever, Crystal Reports, you know, no matter what database I'm using. But if I have my own query language, I don't get that, right? Like, you don't get people writing stuff that can use your database for free for you. You have to build everything yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fragmentation is a problem of the graph database community in, in a similar way that it was there. Like, we've yeah. tried to be sort of standards compliant on most things that so we have, like, you know, it's OWL and RDF, and it, yeah. we can generate valid OWL and RDF, and we can dump it to those and read from those formats. But uh, in terms of, like, Sparkle, I mean, we can, we can expose a, a Sparkle endpoint with very, very little difficulty, but it's Does just such an use awkward... Sparkle? What's that? Does anybody actually use Sparkle? No, not really. I mean, it's not right. very well. I mean, it, they do in some cer certain circumstances, in in I guess in the academic community to some extent, but yeah. it's not it's not widely used. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily, you know, worth supporting that. And the other graph query languages are even more awkward, I would say. So, I mean, you can standardize on something really awkward, but then there's also a difficulty with that. But, I mean, the, the beauty, the thing about uh, SQL is that it has a simplicity of design that's quite powerful and it's very composable. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it all makes sense together. It's, it's sort of a, it has a self consistency to it. That's really mm -hmm. uh, beautiful. And we need something like that. You know, we need something that has that sort of simplicity uh, of design. And I don't think that the other graph languages really have that. I think whatever it's going to be, it's going to have to be something like that. We would like to see more people use Wackle that it not just be for terminus DB, but uh, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a sort of follow-up question on uh, the relationship between your schema language and Shackle. You know, I mean, I, I personally find Shackle a lot easier to deal with than, than OWL. Um, and uh, it, it seems like you'd be able to, um, you know, write a, be pretty straightforward to write a translation from some kind of Shackle shape into, uh, into a, a, a Python application for me, because I'm a Python programmer, but I, I don't know about, you know, this, the, your, uh, your, custom language right so yeah no it, it, it would be relatively easy so i mean shackle has a couple of things about it so one so al was sort of designed a, as an ontology language not as a constraint language shackle was supposed to is sort of the constraint version um that's sort of uh related but different and shackle uh the the problem there is that now you have two languages to describe what you're trying to describe. 
so we took the uh, we took the approach of just using Al and then treating it with a closed world interpretation as a constraint language instead of using an open world interpretation. So any information that's stored in Terminus DB and is exported, it will still it will be valid Al, uh, but we're more strict about it so that okay. you get the kinds of constraints that you would get from Shackle. So it's not really necessary to use Shackle. Now, when we were looking, for, we kind of looked first at Shackle for a little while, but it was, um, when I was looking at it, it was defined in such a way that, like, there were, there were issues of self-consistency with the documentation. And I nos noticed after, like, I sent a sort of note that there were problems. So they had, like, um, recursive operations with cardinality mm -hmm. that were defined in the documentation. And then that, it actually ends up, creating a, a non-monotonic functor uh, so that there's, it, it's not a sound object to, you, you can't actually say whether something's in or outside of that object. Those, and those sorts of consistency issues had not been worked out yet, whereas Al had sort of a much, much firmer foundation, uh, logical foundation, so it was easier to implement um, in, a, in a way that made sense. Yeah, and, and, and for some reason, um, they decided to, allow you to embed shackle queries or sparkle queries inside shackle which is like come on really guys yeah. you know <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> nice yeah, they, okay uh any any last question before i last i well i have two more questions i'll let everybody else go if they want to go okay uh so the first question is uh what is the the background or what is the backstory of the cow duck or the duck cow <laughs> So it was a, the cow duck is uh, the love child of the cow and the duck. So we had some, one of our first uh, demonstrations of the, uh, of our Rust backend was uh, that a, a duck fell in love with the cow and they, we just had the relationships modeled in the graph. And so that's, that's how we ended up with the mascot. Got it. Nice. Okay. Beautiful. Um, all right. And then my last question is the one I've been asking all of the, the uh, our database friends coming giving talks. For yours, I actually suspect I know the answer. Uh, but I wouldn't want to hear your opinion about it is. Um, I guess my question would be, at this point, how how stupid are your users? Like, are you ever surprised with what kind of problems people hit with your system because they're abusing it in ways that you, you've never thought of? Uh, well, I'm never surprised when somebody abuses the system. I mean, we've had a, like our community so far has been uh, really intelligent. And I think there's, there's an attractiveness of the idea of a uh, revision control uh, graph database. And I think the most surprising thing is, has not been like, I guess it doesn't surprise me too much when somebody wants to do something uh, that's abusive to the database, because that's exactly what I would probably do if I started mm -hmm. using one, <laughs> try to figure out, you know, what happens if I try to, to mistreat it badly um but no some of the really clever things that people have have uh come up with i think is more surprising for instance people have been like looking at the commit graph and looking at it as like uh instead of trying to just see it as a revision control system thinking of it as graphs that change over time and then doing queries across uh the various graphs so you get sort of a temporal graph logical questions that you can ask uh how, how did this thing change into that kind of thing and that really um struck mm -hmm. me because i hadn't really thought of that use case uh, it was really we were just thinking about it in terms of uh, revisions yes okay that, that this is i actually was going to guess that your 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 customers are, are a bit more intelligent uh than other maybe database customers because like i said i think the the RDF, the, the Al stuff is a sort of a bit of a bar of entry that you should have to come in and like people aren't coming to you because they stumbled across like I want something that you know I want a graph database. They they have very specific ideas of maybe what this thing actually can do, and they're sort of self-selecting. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to be people who who really feel like they need some kind of solution to a kind of a a problem that maybe they need a revision control graph database yeah. system. And if they come for that, then they're probably already much more sophisticated in the first place. Yes. So hopefully we, we want to move to a broader selection, but we're, we're going to start from there and then, you know, start making it easier for people to come on board with simpler things like, you know, automatic CSV upload where you just click and it, it yeah. goes in and then Excel for instance, because it's quite easy to write down an ontology that will describe what an Excel, uh, 
spreadsheet looks like, and then you could just uh, throw it into the graph. Okay, I, that, that's awesome. Yeah, this is, this is about what I thought it was gonna be. Okay, so again, Gavin, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, I forgot to announce that you're actually in, in Vienna in Austria. So I, I, don't, I don't know what the time difference it is between Ireland, but it's, it's probably a little bit later. Yes, so, but yeah. It's eleven thirty here, so <laughs> we appreciate you staying up, uh, and, and thank you for spending time with us. It was a, it was a really interesting talk. Again, well, thanks for having me.